Okay, great. So this is the Zeal Call um, special presentation from uh, Zcash Foundation, Henry and Chelsea, and this is for July Zeal Call. Uh, thank you, Henry and Chelsea, for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you guys can um, can give your presentation. All right. So um, I guess the the kind of thing that I wanted to do today is just um, talk through some of the kind of uh, design decisions and uh, stuff that we've built for Zebra so far that I think is um, pretty exciting. Um, so I have a kind of a list of uh, things queued up from our, our docs that I wanted to talk about. And uh, the first thing that is kind of the um, sort of foundational um, uh, piece or like building block of the uh, architecture that we're using for Zebra is a very cool uh, library called Tower that was made uh, for a software called uh, Linkerd, which who's, uh, as another side effect of producing that uh, was uh, Tokyo. So um, Tower is basically a way to generically work with um, asynchronous functions that um, map requests into responses. And you can think of this as if, if you say that, you know, some, any kind of service is um, an asynchronous function from a request to a response, then it turns out that there's like a whole lot of functionality that you can write uh, generically um, in, in a very uh, cool and, and powerful way. So for instance, um, if you want to do like a, t uh, a timeout on some processing, um, there's no need to kind of like uh, implement that kind of timeout logic over and over again. Um, if you can apply a, uh, that behavior, if you can sort of compose that behavior onto any other piece of, of, of functionality that you have. So Henry, everywhere. Oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Could you also, for people who might not be as familiar with Zcash, kind of explain high level what Zebra is and, um, oh, yeah. and then sorry. kind of how Tower like relates to that. So Zebra is our ongoing uh, Rust implementation of our uh, the Zcash Foundation's Zcash node. Um, and we're uh, well on our way to uh, getting it done. And we're, we were hoping to have it uh, uh, done in time for NU3, but our, our schedule slipped by probably about a month. So it's not quite there yet, but it will be done quite soon. So we have um, a whole set of um, sort of components of this, um, this node. And I wanted to kind of um, walk through the, the parts that I think are, are pretty cool um, uh, in, in order. So the, the first thing to, to kind of know is that we're using this, um, kind of uh, abstract a asynchronous functional programming um, style to, to represent basically all of the internal uh, components of the node uh, are all written as different kind of uh, services that can make requests to each other. So the, the first kind of um, uh, big, big piece of that is uh, the network. Um, this is actually the, the first part that we wrote. Um, and as you may know, Zcash inherits its uh, networking protocol from Bitcoin. And the networking protocol is like pretty fun uh, in that, uh, you know, you just sort of send messages back and forth. Um, and if you ever look into the Zcash D source code, uh, because it uh, inherits this Satoshi style uh, networking protocol, all of the networking is done in like one 2000 line long function in main.cpp where all the messages that come in are just kind of like processed. And so um, it's very difficult to reason about uh, the kind of state of the, the network connection or about um, what's happening with any particular kind of data that you might want to get from the, the network. Because if you mix kind of all the state of every connection uh, with each other, um, 
it, it's quite hard to kind of work with things individually. And so what we did was we actually built this uh, translation layer that uh, provides a, a request response uh, protocol. So you can make uh, various kinds of requests like, um, you know, you can uh, request peers or get some, um, uh, find some blocks or, or other variants that we can add. And in, in response, you get like some data that is actually corresponding to the data that you asked for. And when you make this request, um, what happens is you just get a kind of opaque uh, handle that will eventually turn into the response data that you want. So this is very convenient because it means that if you are in any other part of the node and you want to like get some information from the network, you can just say like, can I please have this information for the network? And you'll get something that will eventually turn into either the data that you wanted or an error. Um, so you don't actually have to worry so much about um, all of the, the details of the, um, how, the, how the networking actually happens. Um, and to do this, what, what we do is we actually have a, a small state machine so there's a, this is a kind of a diagram of how the, um, the networking works. Uh, so we have this uh, state machine that is, is scoped to every single peer. Um, and, and what it does is it translates from Bitcoin messages on that individual peer connection into kind of requests and responses uh, for the rest of the application. And each of these uh, peer connections are bundled up into this peer set container that uh, keeps track of the, the, the availability status, like whether some connection is ready to receive a, a request or not, um, as well as uh, information about the, the latency of all of the previous requests that have been sent to that peer. And when we make a request to this kind of peer set, uh, object, it uses, uh, it, it randomly load balances the outbound requests over all of the available connections that it has and chooses the one with the, the, the lower of the average response latencies. And, and most of that behavior we actually get kind of generically out of um, different tower combinators. Um, and so the kind of the effect of that is that if you are using Zebra, um, suppose, you know, maybe you're, you're doing like Zebra D, which is going to be our node, or maybe you just want to have some kind of a crawler, you know, for, for an observatory or something like that, rather than having to manage all of this uh, information about the, the network yourself, you can just call this init function and then it hands you back a, um, a single kind of, a service that allows you to make requests to the network and get data back. And all of the kind of details, uh, well, almost all of the details of the actual kind of Bitcoin networking are uh, hidden away for you. It will automatically crawl peers and, you know, report statistics and everything. And so this component, you know, we wrote it for our, our node implementation, but uh, it, it, it is likely to be useful also for other kinds of um, kind of observability tools um, like, a, like a crawler. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, the next thing that I think it, that, that we put a, a, uh, some amount of effort into that I'm quite excited about is our internal data modeling. So here's uh, part of the spec for uh, Zcash that's describing the um, the transaction data format. And you can see that because of the history of Zcash going from, you know, starting as a, a fork of um, Bitcoin with, and then adding on uh, Sprout transactions and then uh, the overwinter changes and then the sapling changes, um, you end up with a, actually a reasonably complex format for uh, transaction data. So you can see all of these fields and on the, uh, the left-hand side of this table, uh, 
different fields may appear, you know, only in certain versions. And uh, so, so for instance, um, the, in the overwinter and sprout transaction, or sorry, in the version two and three transactions corresponding to sprout and overwinter, you know, this, this field has a, a particular size and a particular interpretation. And then in, in other versions, it has a different size and a different interpretation. And all of these uh, daggers and double daggers um, correspond to different kind of uh, rules about the structure of what this transaction has to look like. So for instance, um, you should only have a binding signature if you have uh, some shielded spends and outputs, or you should only have a join split signature if you have join splits. And part of the kind of design uh, principles that we've been using um, is trying to make it so that whenever we have to do uh, like parsing or validation, um, we kind of push that parsing and validation all the way out as much as possible to the kind of conceptual edges of the program. So for instance, in our um, network layer, you know, if an, a bad message comes in or something, we just close it there and, you know, shut down that whole connection. Um, similarly here, we want to be able to kind of, uh, have a, a representation of all of this data that doesn't require us to kind of replicate all of this um, sort of complex version handling logic all through the, our program. And so what we did was we actually came up with a representation of uh, the transaction data um, that makes sure to try to encode all of these different um, formatting rules and consensus rules uh, as part of the internal representation of the transaction. And the end goal of this is that if you can construct uh, one of these transaction objects in the Rust source code, um, either you know, it won't compile or it will compile and you will have a like, validly constructed uh, transaction. And so this means that in the rest of the, the program, we don't have to kind of keep track of all of these different um, parsing and, and validation rules about like, oh, is this field in this version or not? Because, you know, our transaction is either we're in a V1 transaction or a V2 transaction or, you know, so on. And um, we, we wrote all of these sort of um, uh, sub uh, fields so that, uh, for instance, um, it's not possible to construct any shielded data without having a binding signature um, because the shielded data uh, structure like always has a, um, uh, a binding signature as part of it and either you know, it's present or it's not. Um, and so we've tried very hard to uh, kind of encode all of these sort of structural consensus rules as part of the type structure so that um, any kind of um, you know problems uh, with the representation would just turn into uh, compile errors and it's not possible for us to kind of get confused with different versions or something internally um, so that's pretty exciting um, and then the the kind of third big thing that i wanted to talk about is our approach to doing uh, chain verification um, so I mentioned earlier that we have kind of structured the entire um, uh, architecture around these generic asynchronous uh, function calls. And one of the ways uh, that that comes up is that um, when we do our verification logic, we actually write that as um, some asynchronous uh, verification services. So for example, we have this uh, checkpoint verifier, which was uh, written by a uh, Tayar who joined the, the foundation, I guess, uh, two coming up on two months ago now. Um, and this is, you know, it takes a, a block and um, does the verification or returns an error. And uh, what, we, what we did is um, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, 
we want to be able to um, encode uh, checkpoints up to at least uh, sampling activation because we decided that we, we weren't going to implement um, the BCTV14 uh, proof verification with a dependency on, on libsnark. And I think um, Zcash D also is, is doing this kind of checkpointing now. But um, because we want to make sure that, you know, in, in, in line with this idea of uh, pushing all of the validation, you know, out to the ed kind of edge of the program, we never want to have any kind of invalid or unvalidated data in our, our chain representation. So what we did is he actually made a, a checkpointing system where um, we can, uh, we encode checkpoints say every you know, 2000 blocks or so. And as we're trying to verify the chain, um, we queue up blocks internally to this checkpoint verifier and then once we have enough of them to complete a, a chain up to the next checkpoint, um, then we kind of uh, flush all of them and uh, uh, get, the, um, get the results back. So you can see a kind of um, screenshot of this behavior. This is um, looking at metrics coming off of uh, Zebra D while we're syncing. And um, in this top left uh, diagram, uh, this is a graph of kind of the all of the pending uh, block verification requests, um, and uh, which is you know the, the flat line. So we have a kind of a constant uh, limit on how far ahead we can um, try to start downloading uh, ahead of the the kind of verified chain tip. Um, and then the bottom line is a uh, count of how many blocks are are pending in this uh, check pointer. And you can see that it has this sort of sawtooth pattern, which is representing the fact that as new blocks kind of come in, they get queued up. And then at some point it completes a chain up to the next checkpoint um, and then uh, flushes the, the whole thing. Um, and uh, so th this seems to be, be working pretty well. Um, we're excited about this partly because it gives us a very kind of clean solution to being able to checkpoint up to the uh, sampling activation, but also because uh, our whole kind of checkpointing uh, infrastructure uh, can, can checkpoint up to arbitrary amounts. So this is gonna allow us in the future um, to enable a kind of optional um, fast sync mode where uh, rather than verifying the entire chain, um, you could have a hard-coded checkpoint up to say when that version of uh, Zebra D was released and, and have it on initial block sync, just checkpoint all the way up to, you know, maybe four or six weeks behind the current chain tip. And you can see even in a kind of like totally um, unoptimized um, uh, version um, on the, the top right, we're, we're downloading between two and 300 blocks a second on average. So hopefully we can push that up higher, but that, that already is a quite a, quite a fast um, sync speed. Um, and we are currently in the process of extending this kind of asynchronous um, verification strategy to doing the full verification of all of the uh, blocks um, and all the transactions in the blocks. And the thing that I'm particularly excited about is uh, the way that we can use this kind of generic um, functional programming style uh, from Tower to do a transparent batch verification. So we're hoping to actually be able to uh, batch all of the GROT16 snark proofs, as well as all of the uh, uh, red jub jub uh, binding and spend authorization signatures, not just batching within a transaction or within a block, but even batching across blocks. And, and the thing that is gonna allow, allow us to do that is uh, this uh, batch processing, asynchronous um, batch processing model where uh, rather than, than having to say upfront, you know, here's this sort of set of things that I want to batch over, um, you would pass in a say like a signature verification service or a proof verification service and that uh 
that service will, rather than giving you a, you know, an immediate result of, oh, I've computed whether or not this signature or proof is valid, it gives you a, a future that will eventually resolve to the verification request. And by sharing that kind of verification context um, between different uh, items, so for instance, you could imagine passing this down through a tree of, um, you know, if I want to verify a block, I have to verify all the transactions. And you can pass this context down through that call tree and, and share batching uh, transparently without uh, any changes to the, the, the caller code. So you can actually have code that's generic over whether or not the verification is happening, happening individually or batched. Um, so uh, we, we've been, uh, we have all the infrastructure set up for that. Um, Deirdre implemented it for uh, Red Jub Jub signatures. I'm currently working on a GRUT16 implementation. Um, but for instance, in our test code, you can see what this looks like in practice for uh, ed25519, which we were just using to kind of make sure that the API made sense and everything. Um, and so just with you know, four lines of code, we've created a service that will um, do kind of transparent uh, signature batching, um, flushing the batch kind of every 10 signatures or every 100 milliseconds, you know, whichever comes first. And on this uh, second line, there's kind of a fallback mode to if, the, if something fails, then you, you know, retry on, um, on an individual basis. Um, so, you know, all of this is, uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about kind of all the, the, the work that we've put into trying to build a very high performance and um, high throughput um, node. And it's going to be very exciting very soon. Awesome. Henry, thanks for, um, for that overview. I feel like I, uh, yeah, I'm glad we recorded it. I'm glad we're going to share it online because it's so helpful to see kind of how the sausage is made. Um, I had, I just wanted to kind of uh, summarize to make sure I got it right because some of this stuff did go a little over my head. So you shared with us three things about Zebra that you're excited about. The first is the tower rust library the second was the encoded data structure and that is um, exciting or helpful because it'll help people as they're um, writing code or, or, or writing to the protocol it gives you kind of a helps you along like these are the several components that you need for this type of transaction and then the last thing you talked about was checkpoint verifiers and that's cool because of um, the batch processing you mentioned and quicker sync times. Yeah, so I think the first thing um, is really a, about trying to kind of um, use this. Uh, it, it's not just that, you know, uh, Tower exists, but that we're able to use kind of the, um, the language or the interfaces provided by uh, Tower to describe the kind of network stack in a yeah. way that allows someone to just pick up the, the network stack and use it uh, you know, to request data from the network without having to sort of go through all this um, uh, elaborate ceremony. Nice, um, and, and before handing it over to Chelsea, I know you're um, gonna give us an update on Frost. Can you just talk like high level, Henry, about like when you make these design decisions, what are the trade-offs that help you decide like to do one thing over the other? Like, what are you trying to optimize for? Or what do you, um, what helps you choose one route versus another? So I, I would say for the, the architecture of Zebra, there are sort of two main kind of influences. Um, the first was um, when we were trying to think about, you know, how should we design this? Um, we got some really helpful advice from some of the, the people who work on Tokyo. Um, and uh, they were actually the ones uh, who pointed us to using uh, Tower. And uh, there's a very cool paper called um, Your Server as a Function by Marius Erickson, who uh, wrote it while uh, at Twitter, designing their um, kind of backend infrastructure. 
that kind of lays out this philosophy of like functional programming for uh, asynchronous services. And so that's sort of the one kind of main uh, frame that we had. Um, and then the second frame, which is more in the, um, the context of trying to do sort of very fast uh, verification is um, actually thinking about the way that, uh, you know, a modern kind of out of order CPU processor does uh, processing of data. It's all about trying to figure out, um, you know, what is the kind of dependency chain of all these operations and how many of these, op how can I write this in such a way that I have sort of many independent items of stuff to work on that can be done in, in parallel. And that's actually what we do in our whole, our whole process of, um, you know, downloading and verifying blocks is all written in the kind of style of, okay, we've got this kind of big thread pool that can execute anything we give at it. So try to come up with a whole bunch of independent tasks that it can all work on in, in parallel. Um, so it's kind of inspired by that sort of out of order processing um, philosophy. Nice. Well, well, thank you again for that overview. And um, I might ask you for the, the uh, paper name. I think you said you're... Uh, yeah, I can put it in the chat. That would be awesome. Okay, great. And I think uh, we can hand it over to Chelsea. One last thing, Walter mentioned um, that uh, they've been, there's excitement. People are tracking Zebra since uh, the parody days. And if there's interest in holding some sort of monthly call, I feel like we're on a monthly call bonanza this year. So what's another call? Um, or if you want to piggyback on any of the um, gardening clubs or, or arborists calls, but um, yeah, that's, that's a comment sure. from Walter in the chat. And, um, uh, I think I, I don't want to commit to anything, but uh, you know, <laughs> on behalf of anybody else, but I think that's something that we definitely be open to. Um, and we do have, um, if you go to the zebra uh, repository on GitHub, there's a link from that uh, readme into the uh, Discord where all the development channels are um, for anybody who's, who's not um, already aware of that. Nice. All right, Chelsea, take it away um, with the Frost update. Okay. Take it away. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be pretty quick. Um, so I just wanted to give an update on our work on Frost. Um, so FROST stands for Flexible Round Opti Optimized Schnorr Threshold Signatures. And um, it was a collaboration between uh, the Zcash Foundation and the University of Waterloo. Um, so I have a joint position in both. And so we kind of um, worked with Ian Goldberg, who is at the University of Waterloo. Um, and really, uh, the motivation for FROST was to have a threshold signature scheme that allowed for fewer network rounds when performing signatures. Um, so last year, when we were looking at uh, integrating threshold signatures into the Zcash protocol, um, we looked at the available schemes that were out there, and we basically wanted something better. Um, so a lot of the schemes were undesirable in that they either required multiple, like more than two or three rounds uh, in order to perform signing, or um, they had like really complicated cryptography and like weird cryptography assumptions, uh, or like they didn't actually support like a true threshold scheme. So a threshold scheme is essentially um, where you have N number of possible signers, but you only need T in order to perform um, a signing operation. And the nice thing about threshold schemes is that T can be less than N, and that's nice in practice because you might do something where you generate um, N signing keys, and then you stash a few away in something like, I don't know, cold storage offline, um, and then you only have T, which are online. So we knew we wanted something um, Obviously, we wanted a Schnorr style protocol, so it was compatible with the Zcash uh, signing protocol. Um, and so that is sort of what sent us off on this mission. Um, so we published a tech report back in January, and then we did some fix ups to our, our protocols, and that our, uh, per, our technical report in January had two different protocols, uh, one which was secure in a single, basically in a serial setting. 
and one which was supposed to be allowed in a concurrent setting. But the concurrent protocol was pretty complicated and we made some assumptions that were not actually correct in practice. And so um, we worked really hard and we came up with this protocol. Um, it's basically just one protocol. It's secure in both a serial and concurrent setting. Um, it's really simple. Uh, and the nice thing about it is it allows for single round signing with a pre-processing phase. Um, so essentially you can do a batch pre-processing phase and then everyone can uh, perform signing in just a single round amongst all signers. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. Um, we've had several people looking at it already um, and validating some of the security assumptions that went into our work. And we've also had people outside of Zcash um, express interest in using this. So um, in this paper, it is just a generic threshold signature, but uh, the work that we'll be doing in the next month or so is um, taking this, uh, um, implementing it using the Jub, red jub, jub uh, curve and integrating it into the Zcash protocol, writing a zip for it, and basically making it available for Zcash users. Um, and it's, uh, concurrently, it's also going through a round of academic review. So we are having eyes on this to make sure that we aren't missing anything um, as we're building it. So that's a really fast update. Um, I'm not gonna go into the cryptography at all, but um, if anyone's interested in talking more about the cryptography later, I can talk to you about that offline. Great. That does sound uh, pretty exciting. And just even like the parts that I got were um, having like a single round versus multiple rounds and uh, the NFT like possible signatures versus the actual ones that you require. Can you, um, Chelsea, talk a little bit about other people who've expressed interest in, in Frost outside of Zcash if you're um, at, at liberty to, to discuss that? <laughs> Yeah, I can't talk about the specific cases, um, but individuals who um, have keys stored in something like a, hard, a hardware security module, uh, this is a very appealing use case for them. So any kind you, anytime you need signing done and you want your keys partitioned um, using something like an HSM, uh, this would be a really good use case for this protocol. Nice. And Dara, I saw that you raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, you um, should be unmuted. So, so I had a question. I hope it's not too technical. If it is too technical, <laughs> we can go to Zcash Wizards with it. Um, sure. I, I know that um, the, the multi-signature scheme that Bitcoin were um, intending to use, sorry, I can't, the name slipped my mind. Uh, music? Um, sorry? Music? Yes, music. Yeah. Um, so that originally, uh, I think it was two rounds, and then they found a bug in it, um, and they changed it to three rounds. So, yeah. So one round with pre-processing is a is a big improvement on that. Yeah, we are talking to those authors right now. Um, I can't give away any of the information, but um, <laughs> okay. we are we are in communication with them. They've looked at our work. Um, we've been communicating with them. And the main difference is that um, Rost uses an additional trick um, to allow for secure one round signing. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that. I, Excellent, yes. Um, essentially, yeah, we basically use a trick that does not allow for um, the driver's attack in that it raises the cost to what an attacker would need to pre-compute in such a way that Wagner's algorithm does not trivially solve it, which is what the driver's attack allows for. Um, and we talk all about this in the paper, but I can go more into it. Yeah, I, I don't think I've read the, oh, last revised 18th of July. No, I haven't read that version of it, but thank you. <laughs> I'll read it and then we can talk about it. On <laughs> yeah, you can let me know if it's actually comprehensible. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's the short answer. Um, I can do a longer deep dive into the actual internal sometime. Cool. Nice. Well, Chelsea and Henry, thank you both for giving us a um, an update on all of the work that you guys are doing at the Zcash Foundation. 
also, I might as well shout out here, Zcash Foundation, they do these really great quarterly kind of roundups of what they're working on. So if you're curious about other things, um, I know the Zcash Foundation has made two recent new hires and um, they're also really heavily involved in the governing process. So check out uh, all of that information that's on the blog. And I believe we have five minutes left for Q&A. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if um, Adi from Nighthawk, if you wanna jump in, now could be a good time. Let me just give people um, five or so minutes, not five or so minutes, give people a handful, uh, a little bit of time to ask any questions. Okay, so let me um, give Adi the mic. All right, Adi, the floor is yours. All right, hello. Can you hear me, Adi, now? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm Adi, uh, lead developer of Nighthawk Wallet. Uh, at Nighthawk, we want to make the Zcash uh, experience user-friendly and to spread the adoption. So following the hackathon, we had a couple of updates on the wallet. Uh, is it possible for me to share my screen to uh, show this? Yeah, let me, and then also this is a good time to plug uh, next week's gardening club for more um, dev related projects and demos. Okay. So I'm back. Uh, I was saying again, thanks to ECC for investing in the development of mobile SDKs um, because very few other cryptocurrencies offer support for a iOS or Android SDK. So that really allowed us to build off uh, Kevin and Paku's efforts there. Um, going forward, we plan to focus on usability and the security of the mobile wallet. So we have made some UI changes. I'll show it today. So as an intro experience, uh, this will be the uh, opening screen. It will show your balances and a straight entry to sending Zcash, viewing the address, which makes it uh, the go-to places for a new user to interact with. And if someone wants to convert their other coins to Zcash, we made a small link over here. It's a pretty basic implementation for now, uh, which will alert the user that their address is on the clipboard and they could visit side shift and paste the address to send Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to exchange for Zek, um, which is the future. So <laughs> that's the right thing to do. Um, so that's one change. Additionally, we also made this feature to allow the user to change their uh, light wallet D server. So I'm uh, sending off Aditya PK's Zek wallet server for now but users can run their own nodes and uh, connect to their nodes from here. So this is based on some user feedback that we had received. So we are out there up uh, listening to user feedback and developing this uh, wallet. And also special thanks to the anonymous person or group who donated some Zek to us. And this shows that there is some demand for developing easy to use wallets uh, for Zcash adoption and it makes it easier for us to attract developers um, to, to work on the wallet. So we'll continue to listen to feedback and improve the Nighthawk wallet. And thank you. Thank you, Adi. And um, it looks like we are right at time. So if people have to leave, that's okay. We do have two um, questions that came up. One from uh, Zuko. Does the Nighthawk team get funding to support future development from the side shift integration? And then Chili Bob asks payment URIs, question mark. So I don't know if in two minutes you could try to answer both of those questions. Um, yeah. Or if not, you, we could always talk about them next week. Yeah, they're pretty basic questions. So yes, we I have the URL affiliation link with side shift, but because this is still linking out to a browser, the user is expected to still finish the transaction right here. Otherwise the affiliation uh, fees sharing doesn't go to us. So that's one medium of uh, raising some donations. And on the other hand, the question from Chile Bob, uh, 
payment URIs, yes, that is one of my favorite features. I'm really a, a fan of Bitcoin Cash and how they have handled uh, easy P2P transactions. So I want to make that happen even over here with deep links. So I look forward to that. Thanks for the suggestion. Nice. And um, Brad Bradley mentioned uh, payment URIs need to be finalized to make sure the ecosystem doesn't go in different directions. And there he posted a zip um, to that. So I'm gonna stop recording. Um, I wanna say thanks again to the foundation. And also uh, we got a bonus guest presentation from Adi at Nighthawk. That was a special treat. Thanks for that.